Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining the call. We're just having a few more um, attendees joining the call, but I'll get going. Just a few housekeeping items. Um, as you are joining, you will be placed on mute um, and you won't be able to come off mute. If you do want to speak up towards the end of the session, we are leaving a little time at the end for some question and answers. But in the meantime, please feel free to type your comments or questions in the chat box. And with that, I am going to introduce Sean. So we have the pleasure of having Sean Sherman today as our guest speaker. Sean Sherman, Oglala, Lakota, born in Pine Ridge, South Dakota, has been cooking across the US and world for the last 30 years. His main culinary focus has been on the revitalization and awareness of indigenous food systems in a modern culinary context. Sean has studied on his own extensively to determine the foundations of these food systems, which include the knowledge of Native American farming techniques, wild food usage and harvesting, land stewardship, salt and sugar making, hunting and fishing, food preservation, Native American migrational histories, elemental cooking techniques, and Native culture and history in general to gain a full understanding of bringing back a sense of Native American cuisine to a today's world. In 2014, he opened the business titled The Sioux Chef as a caterer and food educator to the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. In 2015, in partnership with the Little Earth community of United Tribes of Minneapolis, he helped to design and open the Tatanka Truck Food Truck which featured pre-contact foods of the Dakota and Minnesota territories. Sean Chef, <clears throat> or Chef Sean <laughs> and his vision of modern indigenous foods had been featured in numerous articles and radio shows, along with dinners at the James Beard House in Manhattan and Milan, along with teaching and sharing his knowledge to gatherings and crowds at Yale, the Culinary Institute of America, United Nations, and many more. Sean has been the recipient of a 2015 First Peoples Fund Fellowship, 2018 Bush Foundation Fellowship, National Center's 2018 First American Entrepreneurship Award, and 2018 James Beard Award for Best American Cookbook, and a 2019 James Beard Leadership Award. The Sous Chef team works to make Indigenous foods more accessible to, uh, to as many communities as possible. To, oper to open opportunities for more people to learn about native cuisine and develop food enterprises in their tribal communities, they founded the nonprofit North American Traditional Indigenous Food Systems, or Natives, and are working to launch the first Indigenous Food Lab restaurant and training center in Minneapolis. So with that, I'll open the floor to you, Sean. Great. All right. Well, thank you guys very much for having me um, and uh, excited to tell you guys about all the stuff that we have going on in our broader vision. Um, and today I'm just going to kind of go through a PowerPoint um, and really talk about the work that we do, why we do the work that we do, why we think it's important um, and really address some of the issues that are out there. We will have a little bit of questions and answers um, towards the end of the session. Um, so if you guys want to um, add some of that, I think you can add it right in the questions and answer um, panel or uh, page thing, or um, you can just address it in the chat line too. Um, but um, I'm gonna talk for a little while and go through quite a few things. So there's gonna be a lot. Um, so just feel free to, um, you know, we'll save those questions for the very end and we'll have a nice little discussion um, at that point in time. Um, so I'm gonna switch over to my PowerPoint here in two seconds and then we're going to go ahead and just kind of jump right into it. So give me two seconds, I'll share the screen. All right. Good. So um, basically, um, I'm here today to talk about um, kind of the, the modern day aspect of indigenous foods and um, what we should be really thinking about when it comes to indigenous foods. And I'm going to talk a little bit about our past experience, but mostly I want to really talk about um, the vision that we helped create um, to see 
what we can do to help address a lot of these issues. Um, and I really like to kind of go through um, and talk about um, the upcoming work that we have this year called Indigenous Food Lab. And Indigenous Food Lab is going to be opening where we're based here in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, so we're, we're working on getting this um, first food lab opened up this year. And we'll talk all about um, all the different pieces to that. Um, but really, I just want to talk about um, um, Native American foods in general when it comes to it. Myself, um, I've been a chef for quite a few years. I've been an executive chef around the Minneapolis area ever since around um, 2000. And um, I grew up in restaurants, really. My mom moved my sister and I off of Pine Ridge when I was uh, pretty young, just before high school. And move, we moved to Spearfish, South Dakota, where I started working in a lot of touristy restaurants in the Black Hills. And I worked uh, restaurants um, all through high school and college, um, which I went to Black Hills State University there. And then after college, I moved to Minneapolis and just worked my way up fairly quickly into a chef position. So um, I had a pretty good work ethic as a young kid. I worked really hard. Um, and like a lot of families coming right off the reservation, we were pretty poor. So I was just doing whatever you know I could, especially in my high school years, to help out um, and just to have extra money coming in. Um, so um, a few years into my chef career here in Minneapolis uh, is kind of when I had the epiphany of doing the work that I'm doing, of uh, realizing the basically the complete absence of indigenous food and food knowledge in all of culinary seemingly across North America. Um, I couldn't find um, barely any uh, sense of, I couldn't find any Native American restaurants. I couldn't really find too much on Native American cooking and cookbooks. Um, and especially because I was really looking for something particular. I wasn't looking for modern takes. I was kind of looking for solid information as to you know, for my questions, like what were my Lakota ancestors eating and were they growing food? How are they storing food? How are they cooking food? How are they preserving food? Um, and like what kind of, what did they know about wild foods and which pieces? So there was just a bunch of questions and I wasn't finding a, a central point um, for that. And I always tease that I couldn't just go on Amazon and order Joy of Native American Cooking because that didn't exist. So I was just really kind of focused on trying to figure it out. And, you know, and why aren't there indigenous restaurants in every single city? Because we still live in a world today where, you know, we have giant food capitals of the world like Chicago and Manhattan and LA, and there are zero indigenous restaurants that focus on the land that they're standing on. Um, and I just really wanted to, um, you know, figure out some of those questions, you know, because myself, um, I've always loved history. And especially this work has really pushed me into a deeper understanding of true histories of what happened, especially from an indigenous perspective. Um, so I really like to talk about that. Um, and I really like to talk about, you know, because we are here in North America and all of our North American history begins with indigenous history, you know. And I feel like we're, um, our indigenous histories are, are, have been so silent and if not invisible to so many of us in our educational school systems that um, that shift has to have has to change like we have to be able to learn about our own true histories and all of our diverse histories that we have as indigenous peoples all across North America and what really happened to us because you know some of my questions were I was born in 1974 on Pine Ridge and um, 100 years before my birth like my great-grandparents area like they had 100% of their Lakota indigenous education completely intact. All of their traditions and language and songs and stories, um, uh, knowledge of wild plants and uh, everything, like everything was 100% intact within that 100 year period. So how did we lose so much knowledge? So by the time I was born in the 70s and growing up, we had very little access to any kind of food that was uh, truly Lakota for, for where I was at. And um, I just wanted to know like what was lost, you know? So that was kind of the biggest question and trying to understand all of those pieces. So, you know, part of this comes down to understanding uh, some of those terms, like what is pre-colonial foods and what does that even mean? Like what are pre-reservation foods? And I like to talk about the pre-colonial foods because it just gives us an opportunity to, um, you know, understand and just kind of set the base, right? So to understand pre-colonial foods, you just have to understand what the term colonialism means in general. So if you look at the term colonialism, 
A very simple description is just the policy or practice of acquiring full or partial political control over another country, occupying it with settlers, and exploiting it economically, which is uh, obviously something that uh, isn't unique to North America because it's happened all across the globe. Um, and especially coming from European powers um, during the 1500s and onward, we've seen an immense amount of colonization happening and it's affecting indigenous knowledge bases on a global scale. So not just us here in North America, but uh, Central and South America, all of Africa, um, the Middle East, India, Southeast Asia, um, Australia, New Zealand, Hawaii, like we're all kind of in the same boat as indigenous peoples on this global scale. So it's really truly understanding like, um, you know, the damage that was actually done um, to really try to rebuild some of these knowledge bases, re-understand some of these knowledge bases and um, figure out where to start and what, to, what we should really be focused on. So understanding history is just the first part because if you think about how young the uh, United States in general is, if you look at the United States in the year 1800, um, it is barely just, it's basically still the 13 colonies when it comes down to it. You know, it's very small as far as what, what are statehoods. And the rest of the United States, uh, what is it what we see today and Canada and, and all those other pieces, you know, are huge tracts of lands and European powers were taking claim of these huge chunks. You know, France has a huge section, Spain's got giant sections, um, Russia's got parts of it, the UK still is holding on to huge parts of it. But in reality, like all of this landmass is controlled uh, by indigenous peoples as it always had been for millennia. Um, so, you know, during this one century from 1800 to 1900, you know, we see so much, um, so much loss of land, so much destruction um, to ourselves as indigenous peoples, to our communities, to our histories, to our languages, to our foodways. Um, so much happens during this time period in history. Um, you know, like most of the a big chunk of what is the U.S. today didn't even become that until the mid 1800s, like 1847 is when uh, Mexico, what is all of Mexico, um, those lines get drawn um, during that time period. But just to think about that one century from 1800 to 1900, it happens so fast that the U.S. government, that brand, the brand new country sets its sights to take over all of North America when it comes down to this section. So they want to go east to west and take over all this landmass. And especially happens during um, the time around the Civil War onwards. Um, so in the middle of the 1800s is when it gets really aggressive. And we see so much atrocity happening towards indigenous peoples, um, peoples being completely uprooted from their original homelands, um, active genocide happening um, that's completely unreported. And uh, again, like just an immense amount of damage. So by the end of that century, you know, all that's left of uh, land space and indigenous control is just the reservation systems, which makes up less than 2% of the land mass, where at the beginning, at, at the year 1800, over 80% was still under indigenous control, right? So we just have to think about how traumatic that time period was for indigenous peoples and how little is left. And if you look at land ownership today, um, you know, if you're gonna look at all privately owned land across the United States, over 98% of all that land is still owned by white landowners. Um, and that's a direct result of this history of this massive push to wipe out indigenous peoples um, across the board. So there's still a lot of work in reparations that will eventually have to be addressed um, coming up in the future. So during this time period, we saw an immense amount of loss of indigenous food waste, right? Um, uh, we, the general, or George, George Washington, President George Washington, his very first order was to send out his General Sullivan to wipe out um, the tribes in the Northeast and to completely remove them from the New York region. Um, and he sends them on very direct orders um, for the complete and total destruction and devastation of settlements, crops. He wanted basically all indigenous peoples to become prisoners and everything that they had to be basically burned to the ground. Um, and so it actually happened. So General Sullivan sets out on that task and accomplishes it over a single summer. And um, there's reports that they were burning down six mile by six mile swaths of cornfield, which is huge because there was, um, you know, uh, such a high sense of agriculture happening within those indigenous communities at that time that they were, there was massive farming projects going on. Um, and, you know, again, like during that one summer, um, they basically 
do the job that was set out and basically push out all native people in that region um, up into Canada. And so by the end of that summer, General Sullivan writes back to George Washington and lets him know that he basically has done his job. He hasn't left a single settlement or field of corn left there in the five nations um, and basically pushed everybody up into Canada. And that's just how our history starts with, um, you know, between presidents, because even back then, um, the, they named President, the President George Washington, they gave him the name Town Destroyer in their language, which still stands today. So the name for um, President in that language is still uh, Town Destroyer because of that. And we haven't really gotten that much better. In the West, we saw the very, um, um, the very uh, pointed uh, destruction of bison. The U.S. government knew exactly what they were doing. They sent out surveys to first identify how much, how many bison were there, um, and just in the in the southern herd, which was like Mexico, northern Mexico, Texas, up into Colorado, maybe even up into Nebraska a little bit. There was over a billion animals that they, that they counted, like hundreds of millions of bison out there. And they started a campaign to basically act, the US government, uh, US military set out a campaign to actively destroy all of the bison, knowing that it would directly impact and hurt all of the tribal communities um, that were relying on that animal as a main source of all sorts of stuff, for food, for shelter, for clothing. Um, and, you know, it was very, uh, uh, ne very nefarious when it comes down to it. Um, and by the end of that century, by 1900, there's less than 500 animals on the continent in the world, really. They, they were almost driven into complete extinction. So just in a huge upset of, of food waste happening during this time period. Um, and again, like this was all um, a ploy by the United States government directly to do this kind of work. So... I feel like what's even more damaging to us after losing our land space, after losing a lot of access to our own foods, was the loss of our own education. So if you take the time to really think about what is indigenous education, um, it's basically those thousands of generations, you know, millennia of, of, of knowledge being handed down family after family, community after community of how to do everything, how to live sustainably with nature around you, with plants and with the animals. And that's a commonality that we have with indigenous peoples across the globe of having that blueprint to live sustainably with just plants and animals uh, around us, right? So the loss of our own education is something that has hurt us immensely because my grandparents uh, era at the turn of the century in the 1900s, you know, the, that era of children should have been getting the full extent of indigenous knowledge handed down to them like we, they always had, you know, because they would, people would start training indigenous children from, from a very young age, as soon as, like, before they could walk, basically. Um, and this, this education is replaced um, through a direct, uh, a direct assimilation and um, basically whitewashing when it comes down to it. So Carlisle Indian School in Pennsylvania was the first of these kinds of schools at the turn of the century um, when a lot of reservation land was being formed and a lot of these children were being forced off of their reservations and pushed into these schools where they're forced to not speak their own languages, to not dress the way in their, um, in their manners of dressing and to become something completely different. And this, has, this was an extremely damaging time because this was not a fun school to go to. You know, these were uh, military operated schools and th these children were treated basically almost like prisoners when it came down to it. So there was an immense amount of trauma that happens to this generation of children, which again, for me is my grandparents era um, because there's an, so much um, physical abuse, uh, mental abuse, sexual abuse that happens and these kids come home carrying all of this trauma, um, which gets passed down to us today. Like, you know, like we still see um, uh, in our communities a lot of those same kind of abuses. And it's a direct result of this situation um, of these school systems that happened to us and were forced upon us as indigenous peoples. Um, we see those residential schools and boarding schools pop up all over the place um, in the US. Um, you know, there, there, there's tons of them, and a lot of them were operating, you know, well into the 1900s. And the same story with Canada, where there was hundreds of them. And again, these residential schools in Canada were operating up until the 1990s. 
And we're just starting to see a lot of the stories coming out of that time area, time period of how much trauma was put onto the generations of kids that had to go through these schools. Um, and again, like it's just a direct result of the trauma that we're facing within our communities today. Um, so growing up with all of that, you know, um, growing up past all this colonial period, so growing up in post post-colonial Native America, again, like for me being born in the 70s, you know, um, our, you would expect that we would have a lot more indigenous knowledge about our food systems. But again, like we were so far removed, especially where I grew up, I feel like, but you know, we didn't have access to a lot of stuff. We weren't even on our original homelands really. And, you know, I grew up with, like a lot of people did with commodity food program as a main staple. Um, but we know exactly what happens to people to entire communities um, because of data over the past few decades of what happens to entire communities when one of their main sources of nutrition is coming from a program with these kind of food staples um, that are high in starch, high in sodium, high in bad sugars, just overly processed and just very, very little nutrition when it comes down to it to be to maintain a healthy lifestyle, you know. Um, especially when I was growing up, it was just the black and white government issued cans, um, just saying things like beef with juices and stuff like that. And, you know, this, this kind of diet really morphed into what our modern indigenous diet is, because we have a lot of obviously um, home recipes and comfort foods based on a lot of these staples. But this isn't true indigenous food, you know, and we have a lot to offer. And even when it comes to things like fry bread and Indian tacos and fry bread tacos, whatever you want to call them, you know, it has very little to do with who we are as indigenous peoples. And there's absolutely no reason that this piece should represent all of us as indigenous peoples across the board, because we are so immensely diverse and we should be proud of our diversity and coming up with our own foods that have really, that really reflect who we are. Because if you dissect this, this dish and decolonize it, you lose the wheat flour, so there's no fry bread. Um, you lose the ground beef because there was no cattle, but you can replace that with another game meat. Um, you lose the weird California black olives and the iceberg lettuce. Um, and you basically, and you lose the sour cream and cheese, of course, but you know, like true indigenous food is really beautiful and healthy. Like we have wild onions, we have beans from the agriculture, um, we have wild greens, we have wild game, you know, like it's a really healthy dish if you take the time to decolonize our foods. And it's better for us mentally too, um, to be able to have extremely nutritious that that is coming from who we are as indigenous peoples. So to truly understand indigenous food systems, you know, you have to take the time to understand that diversity. So if you look at just ecoregions alone in North America, it's extremely diverse. You know, there's, there's deserts, there's mountains, there's swamps, there's coastal regions, there's so much going on. And there's all sorts of plant and animal diversity and different kinds of seasons and everything growing through this whole area. And then to layer that diversity with the diversity of indigenous peoples, it makes it even so much more diverse. So if you look at a, um, a language map, an indigenous language map of North America, you know, from Alaska through Mexico, you can see how immensely diverse we are because even this is generalized because in those huge blocks of color, there's other sub dialects in there and other languages in there, other people have moved in there. It makes us even more diverse because just we imagine a world where you could travel any direction, east to west, north to south, and visit indigenous focused food businesses and experience firsthand all this amazing regional and cultural diversity that sits across the board. There's just so much to think about and to experience, you know, when it comes to understanding all of this. You know, you can't lump some of us all into one single group because we, again, like we are so diverse, you know, and it's special. Each one of us is unique. Every single range is unique. And it doesn't matter where you start researching, like you can basically throw a dart at the map of North America and wherever that dart hits, it's going to be exciting to learn about the foods there and the cultures there and how things are processed and preserved and everything. So when we're looking at, at the modern day, you know, there's an immense amount of indigenous diversity still left alive because there's 634 tribes in Canada, 573 tribes in the US, um, of which 229 are all in Alaska. 
and 20% of Mexico still speaks indigenous languages, or I'm sorry, 20% of Mexico identifies as indigenous and almost 10% of, of that whole country still speaks indigenous languages. And that's an immense, um, that's an immense population. That's really big, right? Um, and again, if you just put side by side colonial settler states versus indigenous territories, just look at that diversity. You know, there's again, like so much to explore. Um, so when we're thinking about indigenous knowledge, you know, it's not just culinary, it's so much more, obviously. Um, so for us to understand an indigenous food system, we look at all of these pieces on this slide and it's wild foods, it's permaculture, native agriculture, seed saving, seasonal lifestyles, ethno-oceanography, hunting, fishing, butchery, salt, sugar, fat production, crafting techniques, land stewardship, cooking techniques, regional indigenous histories, um, traditional medicines, food preservation, fermentation, nutrition, health, spirituality, gender roles, and sustainability. So we have to take all of that into a, a account, you know, but because of that map, we can figure out um, what a modern day indigenous food system is anywhere. Um, and especially when it comes to, um, you know, when it comes to for us, how we really started was reconnecting with nature and reconnecting with plants was the biggest piece for us to unlock a lot of this knowledge. It's a lot of this knowledge that our indigenous ancestors shared. So for us, plant knowledge is power. And if you take the time to start to learn the plant families that surround you, you're gonna see like our ancestors saw so, so much opportunity for, for food, for medicine, for crafting, for shelter, um, for clothing, for basically everything, you know, it's all around us. Nature gives us everything we need and it's literally right outside our back door. And we need to take the time to really focus on this really important piece of education, which is understanding this natural world around us and how we can utilize it in our modern day today. Because the Western diet um, has never ever um, really looked at the food and plants that are around, are around our unique and diverse regions and make it a part of it. You know, where if you think about all the food at the grocery store or even the, just think about plant diversity, like the plant diversity of a person going to the grocery store, like how much diversity are they actually getting? Most people are surviving off of less than um, 30 plant species throughout the whole year, right? So you go to the store, you get an apple, some tomatoes, some onions, some garlic, some carrot, and people can stop counting on their fingers the diver diversity of plants when they're in their 20s. Whereas as indigenous peoples, we, had, we utilized so much plant diversity, hundreds of different kinds of plants were being used for everything, for foods, for medicine. And that's really healthy to have all of those nutrients coming into our bodies, right? And on top of that, just having all this knowledge that we can be passing down. So it's just important for us to think about like all of these pieces that are out there around us, whether they're fruits, thinking about staples, what uh, plants were really um, so prolific that we were able to utilize them as staples. There's a picture of Timsala, which is the prairie turnip, which has such a large swath of area, which we lost a lot of it when the number one, the bison disappeared and the introduction of barbed wire fencing, which even made uh, the natural paths uh, and, and movement of wildlife even more restricted. And a lot of these plants are very symbiotic with the animals and humans around them to be able to make sure that they're spreading and growing. Things like camas root is another amazing staple. Um, I'm up here in Minnesota where we have the true wild rice, which is something that's so unique and so amazing and is only growing on these uh, great lakes up in these areas up here. Um, and again, like so much of this is in danger because we've ruined so many waterways, we've lost so much of it. So it's really important to understand why people are standing up for water rights and, protect, and water protection and just protection of our natural resources in general. It's gonna be a constant battle for um, people in colonial power to continuously want to destroy natural resources um, for the sake of making profit. When we need to really think about how can we use our natural resources to feed and to bring medicine and everything else and to, and to continue our cultures, our diversity in cultures, you know? So it's really important to think about those pieces because um, these, these kinds of things have made our indigenous communities happy and healthy for millennia and have been utilized everywhere. Um, and there's so much knowledge and it's not just land plants, it's like the water plants in the ocean and everything. 
um, that's just been used for so long. Or in the deserts where all the plants where they look like they want to hurt you and maim you, indigenous peoples know very well how to utilize and how to sustainably harvest things without destroying them, which pieces to use, uh, which parts of the plants, uh, when to harvest them, and all these things are, have been taught as part of indigenous knowledge bases, right? Proteins, I feel like, is a really easy piece because basically any animal is literally game when it comes down to it. Our method had been cutting out things like beef, pork, and chicken because they didn't really exist here not that long ago. And we wanted to showcase a whole bunch of other kinds of proteins that could be utilized and that were way more indigenous when it comes down to it. And thinking about the preservation and the amount of work it went in to preserve a lot of these meat pieces. But again, like anything moving out there is literally game. It doesn't matter if it's a squirrel or a muskrat or a beaver or elk or moose or all the kinds of different shellfish and fish, like everything out there is literally game. And there's so many other protein choices um, out there across everywhere, even insects. Insects was such a huge part of our food system in different regions. And there's no reason for people to be scared of it because you can make these things taste wonderful and even if you go down to Mexico, you can just find huge bins of, of these things out there. And there's many recipes to utilize this kind of stuff. And it's way more sustainable when it comes down to it. Agriculture um, is something that uh, needs addressing a lot because we live in a world where we think of this industrial agriculture machine as the way. But that's not true um, because we know that this is damaging not only soil, but getting into water and the water's getting into our communities um, and it's making our persons, our, our, our own, it's getting into our bodies, you know, it's making us sick, you know, and we should be very aware of the damage that's being done and the dangers of that. Because if you see titles like what, how worried should it be if glyphosate was found in our Cheerios, like you guys should be really worried because that's really dangerous stuff. I mean, it's going to mess with like your, basically it's going to mess with your genetic makeup, you know, it's awful. So we have to think about like, how did indigenous peoples who had such a wonderful indigenous agricultural history survive for so long utilizing so much knowledge, you know, so you go way back to where corn culture starts at the bottom of Mexico and shoots both directions, north and south. And how many different ways that people had figured out for farming techniques, you know, it's immense. And, you know, so and agriculture shoots all the way through Mexico, throughout the entire Caribbean, throughout the entire eastern seaboard, up the Mississippi and Missouri river valleys. And so much agriculture trade was happening in such a large swath of what is North America today. And so much diversity in those, in those different styles, like whereas in Mexico City, when the Spanish first came, they saw them using these floating beds and they were able to have an, an amazing agricultural system that pumped out tons of food for huge populations. Or um, our tribal communities in the deserts, you know, like in New Mexico and Arizona, who figured out how to farm in the middle of a desert, you know, with utilizing very little water and eventually growing those same kind of seeds that uh, was being grown in Mexico with corns and beans and squash and chilies and sunflower and tobacco and all these pieces that they're able to grow in thriving uh, farms, you know, with very little water and making these seeds eventually to become drought resistant, heat resistant, and to be able to pump out a ton of agricultural product in those kinds of regions. You know, that's a huge human feat. And again, like not everything is like the Three Sisters Mound system because again, we are so diverse. There's so many other, there were so many other um, uh, ways that, indi uh, that indigenous peoples were farming. Um, there's a photo here of a woman called um, Buffalo Bird Woman who's a Datsa. Um, and she's using more of a row system, but again, growing the same things that were kind of found way down in Mexico, um, different varieties of beans and squash and sunflower and corn and tobacco. And it's amazing to think how that agricultural um, just spread all throughout because each one of these unique seeds comes from very unique people and very unique regions and we have to be the stewards of those you know we're the generation that has to take care of that diversity and pass it on and preserve it to make sure it can go to the following the generations and save all of this seed diversity that is just as diverse as we are as indigenous peoples here. Um, and re and do make, make the best of our efforts to record their stories and their histories. My friend Rowan White said, it's our responsibility to care for the seeds to make sure that younger generations and future generations that we might not know yet have them. So again, like we have to be the stewards of these situations. So for us, what we did is taking all of that knowledge and trying to figure out how do we apply that in the modern day today, paying homage to our indigenous ancestors and the health that came out of that and what can we do moving forward? You know, so we started just, just 
um, you know, taking this knowledge and doing something with it, taking the time to train our staff to be outdoors, to identify plants, to utilize them in cooking, um, and to just really, again, like reconnect with the nature around us and using technology, like we have smartphones, like you, nowadays you can just take a picture of a plant and an app will tell you what it is, you know? But when you open up your eyes and look around us, you start to see food everywhere. Um, and that's just so important for us, you know? Um, and taking the time to dry things out, grind things into powder, make our own pantries, make our pantries taste like exactly where we live because it's fun you know, to utilize all this plant life around us and chefs should be really excited about it. And, you know, for us, it was creating a team um, and giving people opportunity that they didn't have before and being able to like really explore creativity and see what other, how, what other kinds of creativity comes out of this with these up and coming young chefs and creating businesses around this, you know? So like we cut out all colonial ingredients completely and just focused on indigenous foods of our very particular region. So we cut out dairy, we cut out flour, we cut out sugar, there's no fry bread, you know? We're not using beef, pork, or chicken. We're not selling Gatorade. Like everything is just fully indigenous. We're making cedar and maple teas and we're making um, uh, wild rice bowls and hominy and all sorts of stuff that were particular to the region that we were in. And there's so much to explore. There's so much flavor around us constantly and we have to be excited about it again. Cause again, and it's fun to, to make creative dishes and to put a lot of creativity and artistry. But what was more important was keeping these foods simple uh, making them taste good and getting them out to especially the tribal communities where some of our tribal elders haven't even tasted our own indigenous foods for so long. And it was the elders that remembered like, oh, like I forgot about that plant. It was my, my grandmother and I used to harvest that when I was a kid and we used to use it all the time. And we've forgotten about a lot of these pieces, you know, and it was so, it's so fun to see the elders light up when they taste something that they just hadn't had for so long. And they want to share these stories that awakened in them with the, with the children around them and, and anybody that wants to listen. But this needs to be a mainstay. Like this has to be a part of our diet. This has to be a part of our community and our celebrations. Because it's going to make us healthier on all fronts, on our cultural revitalization, on our nutritional health, um, on just the, our mental health in general, like everything. So for us, we wanted to figure out how can we get this out everywhere, not just the area that we're in. And so that's why we really wanted to focus on, you know, what does create food security and what is, uh, what is true food sovereignty, you know, because we need healthy food access, cultural food producers, regional food systems, we need local control of food systems and not governmental control, we need access to indigenous education, and we need strong environmental protections um, around us to protect our foods and our resources. So our nonprofit natives or North American traditional indigenous food systems is what we're doing to try to help address this with really focusing on two pieces, um, creating access to indigenous education and creating access to indigenous foods. So it's kind of taking the two things that colonialism had against us by removing us from our food and removing us from our knowledge and pushing those two back um, to make that a big part of how we can make a change in the future. So this year, we're opening up this summer, we're opening up Indigenous Food Lab in Minnesota to start with, but we have a broad vision um, to help do this everywhere. So we're gonna be opening up a commercial kitchen where we can do a lot of production. Right now our kitchen is being utilized. Um, we're making 400 meals a day to give out to our community because we just went through a lot here in Minneapolis, not only with COVID, but be because of a lot of this, uh, um, this, this uprising that was happening with the death of George Floyd that happened just a few blocks from us and so much destruction during this uprising is around us and our kitchen we mobilized to be um, to do something to give back to our community. So we're setting up this as a production kitchen where we can also use it as a training kitchen to teach people how do you cook for 400 people a day healthy and indigenously, right? And we're also developing an indigenous education studio so we can start pumping out a ton of video work on a lot of this knowledge base to share with everybody. Um, our real goal is working directly with tribal communities in our vicinity first, helping each one of them that wants to work with us develop an indigenous focused kitchen for their community that we will help develop, train, educate, and support. Because we know food service operations are really difficult, but if we become a training center, an education center, and a development center to help create unique food um, production areas in those tribal communities, so to make menus with them that reflect who they are, their language, their land, and where they stand, we see that being extremely important, you know? 
and just being there for support, you know, and as we get out there, we can in help influence those communities by sharing our knowledge base and our curriculum as we develop it, hopefully giving them access to creating an indigenous community gardens, utilizing indigenous seeds that can be very particular to their area, getting people to think about permaculture design and how we should just be utilizing our landscape with the purpose of creating food spaces and just putting plants everywhere, making indigenous orchards everywhere because we can have choke cherries and plums and apples and wild onions and wild ginger whatever it might be whatever grows in your region like and grows well like creating a permacultural designed area where we can harvest a ton of food off of that because we can landscape any way we want to and we need to be landscaping with the purpose of feeding um, and creating medicine and um, just you know having something around us that's there so we're not having to wander around um, foraging, looking for foods, when we can create land space around us that can have an immense amount of plant diversity for us to utilize. But the important part is having these commercial kitchens that are trained and designed specifically for that purpose of focusing on healthy indigenous foods. And that's where we're coming into play to help design these kitchens, to help train people in these kitchens, to help select which equipment pieces to use, which um, even down to the operating systems of giving them everything what do you do when you open up the kitchen or when you close the kitchen and who are you buying your foods from and helping people with distribution and where they're getting their foods um, and all of that and helping people with menu development and all those pieces that's that's the work that we're hoping to do um, we put out our cookbook a couple of years ago um, which had over 100 recipes using only indigenous ingredients and we're just going to continuously de de be developing education and training um, and creating a whole new uh, a generation of, of creativity and foods when it comes down to it and recipes and really focusing on how we can um, re-indigenize our educational systems and really think about our education from that indigenous perspective and standpoint and what we should be really teaching our children when it comes down to it you know I always tease that our kids can name more uh, Kardashians than they can can tree species and we need to really focus on what's really important, you know, for our next generation. And we want to help develop more food producers and help more people with startup businesses to become indigenous food producers. We want to see a lot more indigenous food production come off a reservation. And we want to help drive that demand so they can immediately plug into it and we can give them the education and support they need to find funding and find money to start these businesses and to just get moving forward, right? Because um, if you can control your food, you can control your destiny and when it comes down to it. So our eventual goal is opening up food labs in every region possible um, where each, each one of these indigenous food labs becomes a regional center point to train, to develop, and to support indigenous and tribal communities in its vicinity to really start to lay the groundwork to, to do that. And then we can start to see that vision of being able to travel across the country in any direction and stop at indigenous focused food businesses and experience firsthand the amazing cultural and food and nutritional diversity that is out there. Um, and it's just going to be really exciting, you know, to be able to do that, that particular work. As indigenous peoples, we must define our own foods. It's really important because the last thing indigenous peoples are going to want are European chefs telling them what their foods are. So we want to give everybody the opportunity, the training and education they need to make their own modern variation of whatever their indigenous foods are and really focus on the health aspect of it. Because for us, this is an indigenous evolution and revolution. So after surviving the centuries of 1800 to 1900, where we saw so much genocide and destruction um, and removal, and then surviving the 1900s, where we saw so much racism, segregation, um, and again, more destruction and invisibility, that we're at, this we're at this era now where we can use this for good and we can use this era as an era of reclamation and bringing back um, the knowledge of our ancestors to make us something stronger and more unique because it's this next generation that we have to be thinking about and the generation after them. These are our next leaders that are gonna be coming out of this and they need to have access to their education. Um, they need to have access knowing exactly what their indigenous foods are and why you're gonna feel better having an indigenous dinner over a McDonald's or a pizza. Um, and just making sure that they can find those food access points out there and be able to explore and think about some of these um, amazing chefs that are going to come out of this era and this generation. 
You know, they're going to really bring indigenous foods of North America to the forefront. And along with that, they're going to bring a deeper understanding of their own particular culture and people. And we can help share this on a global scale. Like we can open up food labs all over the globe eventually and help other indigenous communities everywhere strengthen their indigenous knowledge base, um, bring back more understanding to indigenous foods, um, and just think of a better future when it comes to, to indigenizing our world when it comes down to it. You know, the future is indigenous and we need to, we really need to think about everything we can do to move forward, um, making this a reality for our next generations. All right, I am going to stop there because I'm in full screen and I can't see any of the questions that come up. Um, I think, um, Alona, you are gonna help moderate from here. Yeah, maybe? so so far we don't have any questions in the chat box, but if you do, please put them in there. Also, if That's you wanna good. speak, yeah, what's that? I was just saying, there's got to be one question out there. I see there's 22 attendees, so somebody's got to have a question. Yeah, no, I'm definitely getting some feedback via some people that have my, my cell phone telling me that they're just really enjoying your presentation, Sean. This is amazing, oh, and I can you. attest to your cookbook. That's kind of how I, I found Sean. Um, both my, my colleague Caitlin and I are both part of Montana American Indian Women's Health Coalition. And we had, um, we want to do a, a care package thing and I wanted to put some indigenous recipes in these care packages. And I thought, oh yeah, that's right. I have this cookbook. And so not only have I looked at the, the recipes, but I've used a couple of them and they are amazing. And I had the opportunity to actually um, eat from the Tatanka truck last fall and it was amazing. So um, anybody that's in the Minneapolis area, if you have an opportunity, I highly suggest um, the Tatanka truck. So let's see, Q and A. There is one question. So um, Mary Erickson asked, are you currently partnering with university systems and their entrepreneurial programs or agricultural programs to spread? And I, uh, we, I, I see a very unique relationship with higher education because we've been able to travel um, all over the US and Canada and um, we've been able to do a lot of talks with some um, student bodies everywhere. And I feel like there's such a unique opportunity, especially for us, because we're gonna be really focused on developing our educational programming um, with our indigenous focused education. And I think it's gonna be a really unique situation where we can work directly with um, higher education facilities. We can help them to develop um, uh, indigenous um, planning into their food service operations, number one. So their students would have access to experiencing indigenous foods um, of their particular region. And it also gives us the opportunity to work alongside those uh, professors and students um, to take on joint research and development projects that will help benefit all of us because it gives the opportunity for the students to be able to work on projects. It gives the professors um, some focus to work with and it helps us um, to, continue to, to, to continue to grow our curriculum base of what we can be teaching and the knowledge that we're gonna be pulling out of. Because I feel like we've done a lot already, but we're barely scratching the surface and there's so much education that we can be pulling out of this new focus. Um, and hopefully we can partner with um, these entrepreneurial and agricultural programs. So as we get um, people coming through us who are interested in starting a business or interested in starting um, more farming, that there could be training and education available to them um, that we can partner and work with. So I think it's really exciting to think about the possibilities of all this higher education um, that can be out there. Great. Also, Colleen in the chat, she said, I love the Food Awakens stories. Do you have an example of how this could work in the simplest form, limited resources? Um, I love the Food Awakens stories. Um, so if I'm understanding, I'm talking about like when the elders kind of have their, the food knowledge memories, is that kind of where that question is, would you say? Maynette, maybe you want to put Colleen as panelist so she can clarify her question. Um, maybe in the meantime. Yes. Um, so, I mean, I think it's really important that people, that we do just, you know, within our communities, just do a, an all indigenous dinner with people. Like we're going to celebrate this community dinner with all indigenous foods that we spent a few days harvesting and gathering or butchering or whatever it might be and getting people really excited to share stories about some of the memories that they have from 
from their own grandparents or parents or great grandparents even, um, just to, to get the community, ex the communities excited about the possibility of making that a mainstay of always having something indigenous because, you know, we should be serving wild teas over like orange drink and sodas, obviously, you know, things like that. But I think a lot of it is just, um, it's really important for the elders to share some of those memories that they might have of how they remember um, the, their elders um, utilizing those pieces and those flavors. Um, and it's really great to see, again, like all of that food memory come pouring out of people when they taste some of this for the first time in a long time. I mean, it's important for us um, to have access and to try these foods that are right around us and we're no longer utilizing, you know, because they they're like our ancestors. They're alongside us. They're our family. That's, they've been with our ancestors. They've been with our great grandparents and our great great grandparents. And we have to make sure that they're a part of our, our daily meal situations. Hope that helps. Great. And I see Sarah also asked, what is your perspective about Cahoka's role in a, as a region in rejuvenating indigenous food in the middle America in terms of the history of that region as previous Mecca for native food trade? Um, well, I think Cahokia has a really unique history, obviously, because it was a, a center point, you know, it's bringing in um, tons of artistry and, and, and people from all over that region. And then when Cahokia um, kind of, what you know, started to dissipate, um, it spread people out in many different areas, carrying a lot of that same knowledge base, you know, and I think you can trace a lot of that directly um, um, through that time period in history. But I think thinking about it in a modern day situation, like we have this, we have such easy access to education with the internet, you know, so that's why we're going to be focusing on developing and centering ourselves to be a center point to be able to record um, and make accessible a lot of indigenous knowledge um, through video and through audio. So people can tap into us ideally anytime once we start just like compiling tons and tons of videos on all sorts of topics around indigenous focused education. And I really feel like that is kind of a new Mecca because education is one of the, going to be one of the most important parts to preserve and to be able to share with the future generations. Um, and so we need to be recording everything we absolutely can right now um, to be able to grow with this. But I think it's a great analogy to use Cahokia um, in terms of how we think about modern day indigenous food trade and, um, and, just the, and just the spreading of knowledge and education bases. All right, and then there are a few question and answers in there. I don't know if you can see that, Sean. <clears throat> um, yeah, so Mary Erickson again asked, do you have any data sources showing the relationship between eating a diet balanced with indigenous foods and chronic disease prevention wellness? I think there's already a ton of obviously data out there. Um, there has been more studies coming along with decolonized diets here and there. But I think that if you really look at what is an indigenous diet, you know, it's gonna be that low glycemic, it's gonna be high in protein, it's gonna be high in plant diversity, it's gonna be low sodium, um, it's gonna be high in good fats. Um, and again, it's just like extremely diverse and you can find very similar diets and see how they work. You know, because like an indigenous diet is basically like what paleo diet wishes it was because it's really based in diversity and region uh, and peoples instead of kind of just a, a made up rule set of, of a certain area. But, you know, just breaking down an indigenous diet in the simplest forms, you know, even like if you look at um, uh, some of the studies before that, like uh, indigenous peoples in North America didn't even really experience tooth decay because of that low glycemic diet situation, you know? So it's gonna do everybody any good. Like this particular diet, um, you're gonna find uh, plenty of studies out there that with similar diet bases, but we can really focus and we can learn a lot more. And we should be creating more food challenges of people going on indigenous diets for 30 days or 60 days and, and, and tracking the changes. Like we have that opportunity in real time to be able to do that with the internet, you know, and especially as a lot of us are forced to um, be in quarantine and, and stay away, it's a good time to really focus on health. And it's a really good time to take a lot of that data um, and see how people feel after they just eat indigenous uh, foods for a, a good period of time. 
Um, so there's another question by Carrie Howard. It says, have you worked with any healthcare providers? I think some are starting to realize how important it is to understand food as medicine. Um, yeah, and I think that's gonna come around a lot. Um, when we, here in Minneapolis, we do have support with some of the big um, healthcare providers, or we're using a grant from Medtronics right now um, just to help get healthy food out there. Um, and we are kind of uh, um, unapologetically just serving healthy indigenous foods to all these people in need. You know, I know some people would rather have a hamburger or pizza, but we're taking the time to process our own hominy every day and making these grain bowls that has hominy and quinoa and bean. And um, we're processing a, a lot of, we're getting a lot of food from our local farmers in our area. And um, we're, we're using a lot of indigenous protein like duck and turkey and bison. Um, and things like that, we're using wild rice. And we're just putting out these really nutritious uh, food bowls that um, basically have all the nutrition that you need in it. Um, and again, like we don't use dairy or flour or sugar. And um, it's just, you know, it's just a perfect diet when it comes down to it. And it's even, it's so great because it's so diverse. You know, it's so different whether you're in New York or if you're in here in Minnesota or Montana or California or Alaska or wherever, like everywhere is just so unique and in, um, and there's so much to explore, to really explore the true flavors of every particular area. So hope that helps. Um, what else? Uh, Sarah says, indigenous diets may have a, may, sorry, indigenous diets may be a big change to people. Do you have some examples for modification in cooking with an indigenous focus? Small steps. I think our cookbook did a pretty good job with that. Um, we did offer a few suggestions on modifications, but really we just wanted to get people to think about and explore, like start to learn the plants right outside your door. Like, you know, just go around your neighborhood, wherever you live, start to identify what the trees are, um, start to read about how indigenous peoples use those plants for food, for medicine, and just experiment with it. You know, if you have some pine or cedar, like use that as a seasoning when you're braising or making a soup, you're gonna taste it, you know? Um, get to know some of the plants that you might have bergamot or hyssop or any of these really strong flavors that are around you that you can just harvest and hang up and dry out and utilize as seasoning throughout the year you know there's just so much out there you know and like we use mostly uh commercial sunflower oil for example for our cooking oil um we work directly with farms and even though not all that like we're not 100 percent indigenous uh, when it comes to our food base um, when it comes to plants because we just love plants and vegetables and we just want we live in a modern world we have access to all sorts of great vegetables but we want to really focus on some of the indigenous flavors but we're not afraid to use a bunch of bok choy or something else you know because uh, vegetables are awesome and we should be eating a heavier plant-based diet anyways when it comes down to it um what else do we have there So far, I'm not seeing too much, but I can definitely speak to that, um, you know, a couple times now that I've gone on a few hikes, being a North Dakotan, coming to Montana, um, going for hikes, it's obviously, it's a kind of a new concept for me, but um, I did take pictures because, of course, I had forgotten my little book and I didn't realize that there is an app. If you have any suggestions on apps, Sean, that would be great. Or when you yeah. walk through and, and see the plants and stuff, um, and it, it mean mentally, I felt clear, I could focus more. It's just, I mean, for mental and physical health to be able to go out and <clears throat> identify and then to use these plants, it's just a, it's a different um, feeling you get when you start eating cleaner and healthier and, and understanding what you're eating. Yeah, and it's uh, also <laughs> exciting people are out there foraging, learning how to harvest plants um, sustainably so you're not damaging them. Um, taking the time. There's lots of videos out there of people who are well versed in foraging. There's lots of books uh, obviously available. I use an app called Picture This um, a lot when I'm not positive. I'll just take a picture and if you're in a space where there's no cell coverage, no big deal because you can just take pictures and go back and use the app later when you're in service again um, to pull out that information. Um, so I think that there's a couple other apps out there that do the same kind of work. Uh, I think uh, there's one called Leaf Snap or something like that too. But there's a, we have a lot of um, you know, uh, access to utilizing technology to help us with this understanding. Um, and again, like every area is unique. Obviously, if you're experiencing from 
the North Dakota plains to the mountains and the and valleys in Montana, like there's just so much diversity of plants that you'll find in those two very unique regions, right? Um, but again, like so much cool stuff is out there and you're, you know, we should be learning more about that and making sure that um, you're taking our kids with us. You teach the kids a few uh, easy edible plants to pick, like um, even some invasive ones like dandelion and plantain. Um, and uh, they're, you know, just have them pick a bunch and kids get to run around and you get a free salad at the end of the day, basically, right? Um, just make sure they know what poison ivy looks like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There is a, um, they asked, uh, please let us know how to connect with Sioux Chef educational webinars as they are developed. And this is from Sal Wilhelm, Sarah Wilhelm's up in Red Lake. Um, nice. Next month, we do have a webinar with um, doctors Lori and Robert Byron, who have Montana Health Professionals for a Healthy Climate, and that's going to revolve around how our environment affects our physical and mental health. Um, and then in August, we are hoping um, Sean's co-founder, uh, Dana Thompson, will be on in August as well. Yeah. So, Yep, and Dana really focuses on um, addressing the, uh, the ancestral trauma um, and how these, uh, how our indigenous foods can really help um, alleviate a lot of that and address those issues. Um, and again, it's all working towards a healthier future. Wonderful. Well, I thank you so much, Sean, for coming on and speaking. I think, I think for the majority of us, we're all, or all of us, I could say, um, very much appreciated your content, your slides, your presentation was phenomenal. So thank you very much. And thank you for the work you, you do. Hope Hopefully we can all do it in person someday soon when uh, everything kind of lightens up, right? <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> all right. Okay. This concludes the webinar. Thank you everyone for joining. Have a great all rest right. of your week. Bye. Bye.